Father, we just thank you today for your goodness and pray, Lord, that by your Spirit you'd, you'd just help us to have our ears open to what you're saying to the church in this hour that we live in. I pray, my God, that you will motivate, activate, touch the things of you that you've placed in us, that we might be part of this great end time revival. We might be part of what you're doing, not what man's doing, but what you're doing on this planet in the hour that we live in. We want to serve our generation. And Father, I'm praying for a move of your spirit, praying, Lord, that revival fire will burn across this nation. And for that, I'll give you all the praise and give you all the glory. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Tom was talking a little bit about uh, some of the things we heard on Monday night from Martin Isles that, that shocked me. The abortion clinics now are finding ways and people are finding ways how to purchase body parts. And some of the things that they're looking for shock me. They're looking for a little heart that is still beating. They're looking for bodies that are like whole heads and things like that, which to me is just disgraceful. And one of the guys spoke to me on Tuesday night and said that in our own hospital here, just last week, a little baby that was aborted was actually aborted alive. And it was just placed either in a bucket or on a table to die. Fortunately for that little baby, there was a Christian nurse. And she went over and she picked up that little baby and carried it around the hospital for the next four hours until it passed away. Friends, we live in a world that is going to the pit. People can even think of doing things so despicable, so horrid, so horrible. Church, we want to sit passive. We want to just be nice. No, I want to say this. I believe it's a time for war. I believe it's time to declare war on what the enemy's doing in our nation. And some of the stuff that's going on is just horrific. So I want to speak again today about the King of Glory. have been speaking a lot about it lately. This King of Glory wants to come into the church. He wants to come into you and I. I've made a statement many, many times in the past, and that is this, that Jesus wants to have his church back. Jesus wants his church. And what that means is he wants you. He wants me to be totally 100% our thinking about the kingdom of God and about the church and about what God wants to do in this nation. He wants to fill us with his power. He wants to drive out weakness. He wants to drive out failure mentality and fill us with himself. How many people want to be filled with God? You see... What I found is this, letting in the king of glory is not as easy as it sounds. Because you see, he's got to get past that flesh man. He's got to get past that man. I want to just read some scriptures to you this morning. and One of them is found in Ephesians chapter 3. I love Ephesians. It's an amazing book. And I'm just going to read from verse 16. This is what he says. That he, Jesus, would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend, understand, whatever that means, with all the saints, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all, everybody say all, not a little bit, with all the fullness of God. 
Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, that he might, that, sorry, to him be glory in the church by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Then it goes on and says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy. I believe that Jesus wants to bring us into his glory, into his power, into his presence, to empower us that we might be able to walk worthy of the call of God on this planet. Not to walk as mere men, not to walk as failures, defeated, frustrated, broken, whatever it might be, but to walk as men and women of the Most High God. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I believe that Jesus wants to touch our thinking, the way we think, the way we comprehend, the way we receive when God says something that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean that we can? Or, or is that just an idle tale, a wives tale or whatever it is that people just murmur and say and then walk away and forget all about it? I believe that God wants to build His church. He wants to come into His church in all His power and all His glory. Paul's prayers, according to the riches of His glory, not our feelings. You see, what I've found in my life, if I feel defeated, I usually walk around defeated. Something's got to change or shift the way I think. Something's got to, somehow or other, the Word of God's got to spring up in me because my feelings are the things that pull me down. To be filled with the fullness of God. Wow, I believe that that is just an amazing statement. Can we comprehend this? You see, most of us understand and know who we are and how we do life. And Anybody here ever think much of your failure? Tom was regurgitating some stuff there today that he didn't even want to remember. But somehow or other, those things keep coming back to us because, you see, there's a flesh part of us. And that flesh part of us wants to remind us of our weakness and our failure. And when you want to rise up in God, when you want to do something in God, usually that thing comes and says, but look at you. you who are, you're a nobody. You abused your kid. You did this and you did that. Anybody, am I talking to myself or am I the only person like this? See, what the enemy wants you to do is he wants you to think you're the only person like that. Before I got saved, I often say this, I needed to get saved. I almost drove Nancy crazy, literally. I was so self-centered, so full of myself, so full of me, my, and just all about me. I walked around with a chip on my shoulder. I walked around full of anger. I got so angry. I used to punch walls, and that was before Jip Rock. <laughs> it's amazing, the, you know, just I, I used to work with my anger. I liked it. <laughs> Rise up there and get angry and all of a sudden I, I was a giant and I would walk up to a wall and I'd just slam my fist through that wall and I'd just look at it. But one day I hit the stud. And it's amazing how when that used to rise up in me again, next time I was going to punch the wall I'd look for the stud <laughs> and make sure I didn't hit the stud. I got so angry one day in the kitchen with Nancy. She was beside me and we, it wasn't all that big a kitchen, but I was angry. I don't know what I was getting angry with, but, but I used to just do things and, I, and I, I got so angry that I walked over to the, the kitchen cupboard there and I, and I kicked that door so hard that I knocked it off its hinges. I also broke my foot. <laughs> I remember, Nancy would remember this well, <laughs> and I was in the bathroom with a tap running on my foot and Nancy walked in. I don't know why she even bothered. She should have come in with a saucepan and hit me on the head. 
But she looked at me and she said, what's happened? I said, I've broken my foot, I think. But the doctor, when I went to the doctor, he said, well, you don't, I'm not going to put you in a cast. He said, just wear a shoe, a reasonably tight shoe. But he didn't tell me that I was supposed to take it off at night. And so I'd go to bed with a shoe on, quick, didn't live in daylights out of Nancy all night. I'm saying all this for a reason. I loved it this morning when, when Tom was picking up the cup There's only one thing that can change a mongrel like me. It's the precious blood of Jesus. There's only one thing that can change a person is when the King of Glory comes in. The stronger one. The all-powerful one. It's not by chance this morning, Tom, that you spoke about those things because a lot of things that you spoke about is in my notes. What changed me? The King of Glory came in. When the King of Glory came in, something died. Anger died. Self, selfish ambition died. Unforgiveness died. Lust died. Pride died, etc., etc. You can write your own list. We have to work with God, who is spirit, not our feelings which are flesh we've got to work with God you know the hardest person I found to forgive was myself and you battle most probably like me with yourself forgiving yourself and I want to tell you that's the greatest weapon I believe that the enemy can put upon us the Bible tells me there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And what I'm saying today is I've got to learn to work with God. I've got to learn to put down the lies of the enemy when the enemy comes in. When he comes in to persecute, to pull me down, to, to try to destroy me. The hardest person was myself. But as these things began to die in me, I started to find the Lord. I started to find a Savior. And I want you to open up your Bibles with me today in Isaiah chapter 6. It says, The year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. We spoke a little bit a couple of weeks ago about Uzziah. Uzziah died. Uzziah was a king. He was, became a king when he was about 16 years of age, and he served the Lord with all his heart. But over a period of time, something happened to him, and pride or something entered into him, and he wanted to burn the incense instead of allowing the priest to do it. And God got upset with him. And the Bible says that the man became leprous until he died. Leprosy speaks about separating from God. Something in this man, pride, arrogance, I don't know what it was. All I know is that I have to put myself in that place. The, die, the day Neil Myers, his anger died, he began to see God. The day we start to shift and stop the enemy from lording over us, you'll start to see God in a whole new way. You'll start to see the presence of God. So I just want to go on from there. Above this throne stood Sheriffan. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. That speaks about humility in the presence of God. With two, he covered his feet. That speaks of our walk with him. And with two, he soared or he flew. That's our life with Christ. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
The, the whole earth is full of His glory. Friend, I want to tell you today, many times we look and we say, well, God's going to fill the earth with His glory. Way back in Isaiah's time, He said the whole earth is full of His glory. Today, I believe that the whole earth is full of His glory. And as these cherubim, as they, as they flew around and as they were doing their thing, they cried out to one another and they cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Smoke speaks about the presence of God. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Tom was mostly thinking that this morning or as he was preparing. Woe to me because I am undone. I've done this wrong. I've done this bad thing. Woe to me because of my life and who I was and how I lived before I got born again. And even stumbled in the process. Anybody else? Woe is me, for I am undone. What it means, I have destroyed, I'm cut off. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But something changed, he says, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal. Everybody say live. A live coal, not just a coal, but a live coal. If there's something that we, the church, need to be touched with in the hour that we're living in right now is a live coal from the altar of God. Amen? Anybody else want, want something like that? Why don't you just lift up your hands and say, Lord, I need a live coal from the altar of God to touch me this morning. I need a live coal to touch me from your very altar today. A live coal touched him. Which was taken with a tongue from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your, and your sin is purged. What that really means is your sin is atoned for. Your sin, the price has been paid. It's all been done. There's nothing you can do about it. What changed me? The King of Glory came in. What changed desire? The King of Glory came in. When He came in, all these things started to break and change. The whole earth is filled with His glory today. It is filled. We need to have our mouth touched with the live coal taken from the altar of God. Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among the people of unclean lips. We shared a little bit about the world system that we're living in today, where abortion clinics and other things that are going on, where there's so much heartache, so much trouble, things that are going wrong. But Isaiah saw the Lord and it changed him. I thank you that one day, without me even understanding, that somehow or other God got around my life. And I didn't see the Lord necessarily out there hanging on His cross, but I saw the Lord in two men. Bevan Jopling and Tom Scarlett. Two men of God that came to our church, little Methodist church, and the out skirts of Townsville. And they brought their guitars and they began to sing. And I could see something radiating out of those people as an unsaved man, as a man full of rubbish and negativity and failure and defeat. Goodness knows what else. But as those men, as they shared, I saw the Lord in them. They began to change my life. I've had encounters with God and God's touched me and I thank God for that. This man was a man of unclean lips, but he saw the Lord.
I pray today that we will see the Lord high and lifted up. Sitting on his throne, his robe filling the temple. I pray today, honestly and sincerely, that we would get a fresh glimpse of God. Get a fresh glimpse of Him in all His glory. King of glory wants to come in to your situation, my situation right now. Seraphim cried out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. As they begin to make this declaration, and I believe honestly too, it's not a time to be quiet, it's time to make declarations. It's time to speak out what we really believe, whether people laugh at us or whether people misunderstand us. It's not our purpose, it's not our plan. But we cannot allow things to stop us from declaring what God has put in our hearts, what God has put inside us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. As they begin to make this declaration, the posts and the doors were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out. See, if anything's going to be shaken, if this nation is going to be shaken, it's going to be shaken as the church rises up and becomes a voice. It speaks out what we believe. Starts to start to speak to people. Yes, it's going to take a lot of guts to, to go into that shopping center with a little bag and walk up to somebody. I remember that little ad in the on the TV where this lady threw some money in the guy's cup and she thought he was a beggar, but he really wasn't. He was just sitting down having a coffee. <laughs> People might get upset with you. People might even get mad with you. But it can't stop us from being a voice because it might be that one person that you walk up to, that you hand them to something, that that could be the thing that could break the stronghold of the enemy around their, their lives. I'm binding the strong man. I'm loosening the captives. That went, friend, we're not here just to play life. We're here to be the body of Christ. We're here to be the church, the church triumphant, the church victorious, ruling and reigning with Christ. And I was, as I was reading this thing, and as I just, the scriptures there, and, and the place was shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And it's interesting sometimes because, you know, that can be a loud voice or it can be a small voice, but I want to, I want to emphasize today that it's a voice. And it carries the mantle and it carries the anointing. There is power in the voice of truth. There's power in that voice of truth as you speak out the truth. The house, the whole house was filled with smoke. Spoke, smoke speaks, spoke smoke, <laughs> speaks of the presence of God. Today we have smoke machines. I, I pray that they're waiting for the reality. I'm not against smoke machines. I was one myself once. <laughs> We need to tap into, the, into God's provision for us. Woe to me, I am undone, I'm destroyed, I'm cut off. Sin separated, separates us from God's answer to life's problems. Sheriff and took a coal, a live coal, and touched his lips, his mouth, and he said, your iniquity, your sin, that which separated you from God is taken away and your sin is purged, it's atoned for. I want you to have a look with me in the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Friends, I am convinced 
that God is going to move mightily on this planet. Are you? Verse 46, Tom will understand what I'm talking about a little bit earlier. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, something else and something else. <laughs> my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? Why have you poured the fury and the wrath of man's sin on me. Why? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man, he is, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. I want to tell you that as soon as they heard that word Elijah, they remembered that this is a man that when they sent people to get him, he just called down fire and consumed 50 of them at a time. And they thought, man, if that guy comes back and sees what we're doing to Jesus, he's likely to call down fire. So I'm going to act like as if I really care for this bloke, so I'll give him a drink. Fear filled his heart. Tried to do what was right. It didn't really help much. The rest said, let him alone and see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. I want to say this, when you start to do something, when, when you start to, 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 to speak, when you start to activate, motivate, do what is inside of you, things will start to change. And here's Jesus hanging on a cross. Here's Jesus with the pressure of life and everything on him. But in the midst of that, he started to cry out. He started to cry out with a loud voice. And as he began to cry out with a loud voice, things started to happen. And church, I want to tell you this, nothing will happen until we start to cry out. Until we start to get to prayer and know what prayer really is. Start to gather together and start to make declarations and start to bind the strong man and start to release the captives and start to speak to those that are bound and afflicted and lay hands on the sick and watch them recover and do things. I don't know, with Tanil the other day there, I knew she was in pain. I don't dance. Nancy will tell you that. I don't dance. I never went to dances. But somehow or other, I grabbed hold of her and started to dance. You say, you, I thought, when I was doing it, I thought I was an idiot. I thought, what are you doing, you idiot? But you see, you just got to do what you got to do. <laughs> God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God says obedience is better than sacrifice. All we got to do is be obedient. I'm not trying to tell you to be something else that you're not. I'm not trying to ask you to go out there and do something that, that you know, you don't feel to do. But I want to tell you, you've got to do what you feel you've got to do on the inside. What God's telling you to do. And you'll break through and you'll break into something. And it says there, it says there and, and, it, and it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, everybody say, Then. Then, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and their bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised coming out of the graves after his resurrection and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Friend, I want to tell you, putting church notices in is not going to cause much change, but becoming a demonstration of His power, breaking the strongholds around our own life, releasing what God has inside us, Becoming a voice, becoming one that will cry out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. When the guards saw the hand of God, they feared greatly. 
They said, truly, this was the Son of God. The veil was torn in two from top to bottom. Nothing separates us from, the, from God's provision right now. Nothing separates us from God's purposes in our lives. Nothing separates us from God's presence. Unfortunately, what happened after that day, the priests sewed the veil back together. False religion, wrong teaching, wrong thinking will sew back what God has opened up. I believe that God opened up a realm of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, that even today Pentecostals are sewing the veil back up and saying tongues are an, are an offense to people. Friend, we've got to rip that curtain back open again. Amen. God needs to get out amongst His people. You open what God has made available to the believer by your words, by our faith. Today there's, a, there's a, an imaginary veil or glass ceiling between man and God. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples stepped through that veil into the supernatural realm. How many people want to go through that veil again? I believe they stepped into God's provision. The King of glory came in. Your words of faith are so powerful. When I come back from my break, I want to go a lot deeper into this. I pray that you might even study it a bit. But Elijah, in the middle of a great famine, a drought, heard the word of the Lord. And he said to the king, he said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Words are powerful. He could have said, when he heard God's voice, he could have said, but God, there's no sign of rain. There's no sign of of any change. Could have just put it aside. But no, what I'm saying today is, friend, you've got to take what God speaks into your heart and you've got to then sow it in your life that it may produce by your words that flow out of your mouth. Out of the innermost being is going to flow truth that will produce what God said, but it won't happen until we begin to speak it out. He said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. The Word of God says to me this morning that Jesus wants to fill us with the fullness of God. I declare that today, amen, that God wants to fill me with His fullness. Amen? Amen? I want His fullness. I, I want the abundance. A fire goes before Him. I've got, to, I've got to catch another glimpse of my God. I've got to catch another glimpse of Jesus. I've got to catch another glimpse of the church. We are not a bunch of losers. We are victorious, ruling and reigning with Him. God wants His church to come alive. God, fill me with your fullness, with your abundance. I see you this morning in your glory. A fire goes before you, burns up all your enemies. Friend, it's good to sit and have it a little bit of an imagination at times and just see God standing up there and, and see the power of God oozing out of Him, burning up every enemy, demons fleeing, crushing the enemy's power. Fire goes, drives out all of your enemies. Friend, I want to say this and I make no excuse for what I'm going to say. I will continually in this church cry out for a revival fire to burn across Australia. 
I will continue to cry out. Because I know that every time we do, every time we do, the words that we speak, though we may not see it, though it may not be evident, I want to tell you that the words that we cry out will carry the anointing of God and the pillars and the posts will be shaken. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you there will be earthquakes and the, and, and the veil will be rent and rocks will be split and there will be a move of God. But people, when they hear it, they will say, truly, this is a move of God. Truly, this is a move of God. I will continue to cry out for a revival fire to burn across Australia. I will back and I will support anybody that's interested in doing anything to bring this to pass. I will say amen to any prayer, no matter how how out of this world it sounds. Because I'd rather work with somebody that believes than somebody that's dead. For God to burn across Australia, for God to visit His church, not this church, His church. I've said it before, we are not exclusive. We are part of a body of Christ. We are part of a move of God. Amen. We're just a, might be a small part, I don't care what part, as long as we are a part. Amen. I believe that God's going to purge out false religion, wrong teaching. I believe the church will be awakened by the fire. Revival, 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 revival. Hallelujah. Amen. Revival. Will you stand with me today and believe for revival? Revival to spread across the land. I pray constantly, many, many times for Roma's book. Not with her, she wouldn't even know I'm doing it. But I pray, and I've spoken to her sometimes about it, that that book is a carrier of life. She's got something out there that that God can use, that God will do something with it. It's been prayed over many, many times. Your life, whatever it is that you're doing, what sounds so insignificant, those little bags of goodies. You might be sitting back saying, oh, I don't know. Friend, I want to tell you, get involved. Get involved, bring some goodies, bring some, I don't know what to put in those bags, but get involved, get around there. Get into the shopping center, get, get your unsaved friend, whatever it might be. Give them a little gift, do something that'll break the ice, that'll break the stronghold, amen. That'll release the bondages that are around us, the religious thing that gets around us. How many people want revival? Well, put your hand in the air and say, Lord, would you revive me? (laughs) I want to be a revivalist, amen? I want to be a revivalist. I want to see revival, 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 revival. If you're in this house today and you're don't, and you not saved, you need to get saved. Don't be such a stupid person. (laughs) Give your life to Jesus. It's the greatest thing you could ever do. It is amazing what He will do for you. If He saved me, He can save anybody. You are not too bad and you're not too good. Some people think they're too good to be saved. I don't need to be saved, I'm good. No, you're not. (laughs) You need to be saved. (laughs) You need to be saved. We need to be inspired. We need to be encouraged. We need to be motivated. We need need to fire God under us. Get up off our blessed assurance and do something for Jesus. Amen? Amen? (laughs) I'm out of words. If you've never given your life to Christ, and today you want to surrender your life to Him, give your life to Him. He'll start a work in you. Things that, that you hate in your own life will start to die. I hated that anger in me. I hated it. You give your life to Christ, things start to die. Thank you, Jesus. A new life comes in. New meaning comes in. Love comes in. Father, we stand in your presence today. You know, today if you're in this house and, and you just, just say, Neil, I, uh, you know, and you, you feel like that, and you just need the spark of the Holy Ghost to touch you, 
just a little spark, you know, we're looking at today as those ambers that are flying across. Man, oh, hallelujah. I just see ambers flying through the air today and they could touch you and catch you on fire, amen. Little ambers want to start a fire in you today. If you're in this place today and you say, Neil, I, I really want that fire of God in my life. I, I really want to stand up. I, I really want, to, I want, I want the, the fullness of God in my life. I, I, I want to break free from this body of flesh. I, I want to be a man or a woman of the Spirit. I, I want to know the kingdom in me. If you're like that today while we're singing this song, whatever it is we're going to sing, would you like, like to just slip out of your seat and come out the front here and believe God to, to touch you today? If you're, if you're not saved today, would you like to give your life to Christ? Just with every head bowed, every eye closed. If you, if you don't know Jesus today, would you just quickly slip up your hand and say, I want to know Jesus. I want to know it. Would you wave to me and say, Neil, here I am. Here I am. Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come into our lives. Just feel free to come this morning if you want some prayer. That spark might get inside you, light you up, fire of God burn inside you. You are here. You're here, Lord. Moving in our midst. Come on, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. I just want to come and stand Working in His presence. In this place, I worship you. I, I worship, worship you, Waymaker. I give you praise. Waymaker.